Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 26. This is from the New International Version. Let's read it together. To the man who pleases him. Shout, that's me. Are you a God pleaser? Come on. Look, don't look, don't don't get all nervous and 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 that, that, that that's the way people get. Uh, well, I don't know, brother Odd. I I you know you're talking about money. Well, let me just help your little heart. Jesus preached twice as much on finances than he did immorality. There are five hundred verses in your Bible concerning the subject of prayer. Do you believe we should pray? There are 2,000 verses in your Bible that deal directly with your financial stability. I don't hear anybody shouting. Two-thirds of the parables that Jesus taught his disciples have directly to do with finances and accountability regarding finances. Why? Because where your heart is, that's where your treasure is also. Is anybody in the room with me? Now I want to talk to you about first fruits. I'm not talking about second or third or tenth or twelfth. I'm talking to you about first fruits. I'm not talking to you about an appendage. I'm not talking to you about something left over. And immediately folks begin to rear up and they say, but Pastor Rod, that is old covenant. Well, let me just ask you a question. Do you believe God never changes? Because in Malachi chapter 3 where it says bring all the tithe into the storehouse is where that exact verse is located. I am the Lord your God. I change not. Therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So if you believe in an unchanging God, you ought to believe one verse later where he says bring all the tithe into the storehouse. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will not open up the windows of heaven. And my God. I'm having a time somebody's getting this right now somebody's understanding you got to let go of what you've had a hold of in order to lay hold on what you've never had somebody's about to let go of tomorrow and the way you think it has to be somebody's about to look for a brook that doesn't dry up somebody's about to look for some ravens to start let me tell you something to the ministry that pleases God if men won't give it he'll send the ravens if the earth won't yield it he'll send it by some other means your God is a God of all sufficiency to the man who pleases him shout that's me God gives wisdom shout I've got it knowledge happiness but to the sinner say that's not me say that's not me but to the sinner he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth in order that he may hand it over to the man who pleases God. I dare you to stand, lay your Bible down, get up right now and set heaven on notice that you are a God pleaser and you are ready for transference I need somebody to tell God, I'm ready for transformation by transference. Somebody that's ready for your bank account to change, get happy. Somebody that's ready for your savings account to change, get happy. Somebody that's ready for a transference. Somebody that's ready for Valor Christian College to receive approval from the federal government for grants and financial aid. Give God glory right now. Somebody that believes this is my year for transformation. Give Him glory. This is liberating. This is life giving. Are you ready? Exodus 13 2. Here it is. Here it is. Lay, lay your hands on your Bible and shout, This is my Bible. It's life to me and health to all my flesh. Oh, I got to get to something. I got to get to something. Exodus 13 2. Sanctify, set apart for a specific purpose. Unto me, God said, All of the firstborn. Three interchangeable terms, firstborn, first fruits, tithe. Say them with me. Firstborn, first fruits, first tithe. Say it again. First, first, and the. Sanctify to me the firstborn, 
Whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both a man and a beast, shout the next three words. You got your nickels? That nickel was God's. That nickel was God's. It did not belong to me. I had no right to it. If I have time, I'll show you in a moment how serious God is about the first belonging to him. Maybe, maybe I'll just jump right quick. You mind? God is ready to deliver. The number 14 is the number in your Bible of deliverance. This is your year. 14 is symbolized by an outstretched hand opening a door. This is your year. It was the 14th day when Paul received a word that not a one of them was going to perish in that storm. Mary was 14 years old when she was given the annunciation and an angel said, fear not. Because you're about to give birth to a miracle the world's never seen before. Is anybody in here ready to give birth to your own miracle? Come on, somebody needs a miracle. So, so God told Moses, take a lamb. I'm over here. Take a lamb. Put its blood on the doorpost. I preached this message for the first time at Bobby Rich's church when I was 19 years of age. Put the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel. For I am God. And I'm going to pass through the land of bondage, Egypt, where you have been held in captivity. And I am going to smite. Oh. Does anybody know what he said next? Does anybody know what he said next? I am going to smite the firstborn of all of Egypt. Do you believe God's a thief? Then they had to belong to him. If he had authority over them, they had to belong to him. The firstborn of all of Egypt will perish. Why didn't he say the thirdborn? Because in the firstborn is locked up the posterity. Oh, in the firstborn is locked up the future. When your you had a lamb, God said, I want the first one. Don't let, your lamb, don't let your you have ten lambs and then give me one because I want the one at the beginning because the one at the beginning has the seed and there is a future in a seed. God said, I want that first one. But look what he did to, to Israel. He said, take a lamb. A clean animal, a firstborn, take its blood and place it on the doorpost and place it on the lintel. And when that spirit of smiting the firstborn comes throughout the land, it will smite Egypt for they are unclean. But it will not smite you because you have been made clean by the blood. When they got to the Red Sea, the sea parted. Why? A lamb made a lane. I want that verse that talks about a donkey or an ass. Give it, give it to me. Exodus 13, 12. Oh, this is powerful. Thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, the firstborn. Every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the male shall be, what? Shall be the Lord's. Go ahead. And every firstling of an ass or a donkey, thou shalt redeem with a lamb. Here's what he's saying. There are clean animals. They are to be sacrificed. There are unclean animals. Don't you dare sacrifice one of them. God said, don't bring me the halt. Don't bring me the blind. Don't bring me the lamb. Don't bring me what you don't want to use. Bring me the firstborn. Bring me the cream off the top. 
and do it by faith. Listen, Jesus was the firstborn of the dead. God didn't send his second son or his third son or his fourth son. He sent his first son, the only begotten of the Father, who your Bible says became the firstborn of the dead. I wish I had somebody to talk right now because you were that donkey. I don't want to call you an ass. You were that donkey. You were that unclean one. You were the one that had no hope. No, without God in this world. Without hope. But God said, I'm going to take the firstborn. I'm going to take Jesus. And I'm going to sacrifice him, the clean, for the unclean. And he redeemed us by being the firstborn. I don't know if anybody's getting this or not. Do you see it? The firstborn. It had to be him. He had to be born of a virgin. No other blood would satisfy. It had to be a cross. Strangling wouldn't work. There had to be bloodletting by which the very veins of God himself were emptied. It had to be pure blood, spotless blood. It had to be the first, the best. Watch. And it redeemed the rest. Look at that nickel. Look at that nickel. Because although I made $30 a week, by the time I married my wife, I had nearly $200,000 cash in the bank. You say that's not possible. I know. Things happen around here all the time that are not possible. And I tell them, don't, don't confuse me with the facts. Well, we need you to know what this is and what that is. No, no, no. Are we tithing? Yes, that's all I need to know. My God shall supply all my needs. But he's not just a need meeting God. The first miracle was not a miracle of need. It was a miracle of want. God comes on the scene and says your needs will be met simply by obedience. I'm here to tell you right now. If you're struggling with your needs, be a tither. Because here's what I've heard from every tither I've ever talked to. I'm blessed. And here's what I've heard from every non-tither I've ever talked to. I can't afford it. This is good. I'm wanting to get to the meat, but you keep hindering me. It's 1131. Have you missed a dose of medicine? Are you all right? Is your timer going off on your roast? Are you all right? I'm bringing you to life. I hope you don't think. I hope you understand that in January at the beginning of the year God is saying to every one of us give me the best give me the first fruits and get ready because I'm about to sanctify the rest of the year I'm about to redeem the rest of the year your cornflakes are going to go further your children aren't going to get sick I'm here to tell you blessing is going to follow you you're not going to have to waste money on blown out tires the accident's going to go the other way God is about to to sanctify everything that pertains to you and redeem it. Give him glory. I'm going to show you something. I'm just going to slow down because I'm not going to get to that. Well, I'll get to it later. Well, I'm going to stay home if he's going to be preaching like that. Well, honey, now listen to me. Don't stay home. If you think I'm not preaching the truth, if you think I'm preaching anything that's not from the Bible, just pray for me. And keep coming. And if you don't have the revelation yet, just ask God if it's real, show it to you. Hallelujah. When you're in a storm, Peter, don't run back to the boat.
I wrote a book. It's pretty good. You ought to get a copy. The most one-sided transaction ever recorded in the annals of human history was ratified by spotless blood on a mean, rugged, ugly, biting beam called Calvary. Now, it was one thing when the Boston Red Sox traded Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees. That was a really stupid trade. We bought the entire state of Alaska, the most minerally rich, resource abundant state in the Union, for 14 cents an acre. Whoever sold it wasn't real sharp. But the most lopsided transaction ever to be made was the great exchange made on that cross. Your sinfulness for his righteousness. Your shame for his glory. That love was transacted by that that transaction was made by love so profound that Paul would say we would have to study to know the breadth, the width, and the depth and the height of such a love. That covenant, hear me, that I entered into with that nickel was not a covenant between me and God. That was a covenant cut and ratified by God the Father and God the Son on the cross of Calvary. That blood covenant was cut between perfection, the number seven, and perfection on that cross, the number seven. Somebody please tell me what two sevens are. That would be 14, are you ready? Somebody got it. It is so lopsided that it would appear to us as the declaration of Moses to the children of Israel coming out of Egyptian bondage, like a mocking dream. It may seem like a mocking dream to you today that you could get to the point where you didn't have to worry about paying your rent. It may seem like a mocking dream to you that you could come to Valor Christian College and there'd be such a transfer of wealth out of the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light that the devil'd have to pay for it. You, just seems like a mocking dream that your business could quadruple. It might seem to you, stand up Mike, it might seem to you, and thank you for that $25,000 check today, it might seem, I'm not bragging on him, I'm bragging on Jesus. I, I, this is a man I've known for 15 years. And three years ago, he was bankrupt. How much business will your business do this year, Mike? Seven million dollars of business from bankruptcy. And you want to sit there and look at me? Why don't you lay hold on it by faith right now? My God, I'm bringing you out of bondage. Quit fighting against me. You know what folks are like when you're preaching like this? Bobby Rich, they're like, they're like somebody drowning in an ocean. And, a, and, a, and a, an Olympic swimmer swims out there with a life preserver to put on them. And they're, they're so befuddled because they're drowning that they begin to fight the person that's trying to set them free. I dare you right now to shout, thank God for pastor. I had a preacher tell me the other day, well, we don't, we don't receive offerings. We don't, we don't talk about tithe. We don't talk about offering because we found out some people leave when we do that. So we just put some containers at the back of the door. Whatever happened to the Bible? What happened to the Bible? 
How do you think that we have unlocked the chains as a congregation? For nearly 40,000 men and women having their breasts cut off with machetes and chained to trees like animals. With two nickels put in a container going out the door. I'm not going to curse you. I'm going to try again. I'm not going to curse you. I'm not going to allow you to enter into a curse and not warn you. And by the way, your Bible says you entered into the curse. God doesn't curse anybody. I'm, I'm going to get through this. Are you all right? So we exchange our sinfulness for his righteousness, our shame for his glory. But the third exchange is our curse. Shout my curse for his blessing. Are you ready? Galatians 3.13. Christ hath, past tense, past tense, redeemed us from the curse of, shout of, the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. Now look at it, because it's very important that you understand that he has redeemed us. There should be a separation there between those words, but anyway. He hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now if you have this book, you have one of the greatest revelations that God ever placed in my spirit. And it is this. That the law is not a curse. Look how quiet it is. He didn't say the law was a curse. He said the curse of the law. Listen to me. Well, I'll read it to you. It is of utmost importance to understand that the phrase the curse of the law the law, the code of God's immutable principles, his character, his precepts woven into the very fabric of the universe is not now, nor has it ever been, nor will it ever be a curse, nor carry with it the ability to curse. Who created the universe? God. Do you know any laws of the universe? Do you know any? Gravity. That's a good one. Gravity. Give it to me. Why doesn't it go up? Is that a curse? It's an immutable law. It is a divine principle that God gave to us so that we could learn. If we drink water, it won't shoot up through our nose. What a curse! That's how we look about the laws of God spiritually. God gives us a law. He gives us an immutable principle. It is not to curse us, nor does it have the ability within it to curse us. It is only the transgression of that law that opens the door for the curse. Enter our pristine parents, Adam and Eve, who walked in the glorious garden of Eden, where the river of life was running and laughing and happy and splashing, and all the animal kingdom walking in kindness one toward the other. And God said, you can have every tree. You can have nine out of ten trees in this garden but of the tree in the midst of the garden of the knowledge of good and evil I'm going to give you a law thou shalt not eat of it for in the hour that you eat thereof you will surely die did God curse them he gave a law to keep them away from 
the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The moment they reached out and took a hold of what God said, don't touch it. The law was broken. The curse entered. And immediately an acute awareness of everything good lay just beyond their sin-infected reach. They already had good. They didn't have shame. They were naked. As soon as sin entered, shame came with the curse. But I've already preached to you when he hung on that tree, he took your shame away. He took the shame away of what you'd done. He took your shame away of what somebody done to you. And in like manner also, he broke the curse of poverty off your life. Oh, somebody ought to give him glory. I said somebody ought to give him glory. Shout, I'm not under the curse. All right, I'm going to leave that for right now. Yeah, I'm going to leave that for right now. You can buy the book. God said, Joshua, go to Jericho. The greatest walled city of fortress of the known world. Don't take your weapons. I'm going to prove to you who I am. March around the thing for seven days. On the seventh day, march seven times around. And when you get done, act like world harvest. Just shout. Now listen to what he said. The city and all that in it is all of the gold, all of the silver, all of the garments, all of the spices, everything in the city, God said, is mine. Don't touch it. But Achan got to Achan. And he stole some of those garments and he hid them. The curse came. The reason God said, don't touch anything in that city is because he had already declared the first belongs to God. Joshua would fight 10 major military campaigns. How many? That was the first one. God said, don't touch the first one. Or a curse will enter in. Belshazzar. Intoxicated on his own power and prowess. Drinking from golden goblets, threw them to the ground. And said, I don't want these. Go get me those vessels from the house of God. And I'll drink from them. They went and took Belshazzar those vessels and he began to drink. I want to shout now, but I don't want to wake anybody up. Your Bible declares that night. That night! The curse came. That night! The river dried up. How's your river? Say that night. That night. The enemies invaded the savings account, the bank book. The investments, their clothes, their closets, their pantries. That night, 
their enemies invaded the land. One more thing. That night, Belshazzar died. There's the warning. Did you get it? There's the warning. Everybody say, come on, get that hand out there. Everybody say, don't touch it. If you leave it for the purpose God decreed it, it will redeem everything else. <laughs> Somebody just shout glory because I can't. No, that was really weak. Shout glory. Shout glory. Shout glory. This year, my family and I coveted together myself and Joni, Ashton, Austin, Mother Parsley, Amy. We always sow at the beginning of the year. We always sow our tithe. We always sow at the beginning of the year one week's income, the first week's income. This year, God said, if you want to go further with me, have I been good to you so far? And God said, how'd you like to see what I could do with the whole month? I said, I'm ready. Listen, when you give him a tithe and he sanctifies the rest, and then you give him a week and he increases you above that, and then he says, I want a month, I may give him a year next. Hallelujah! I'm ready. I'm ready for more than what I've had. He's proven himself faithful. You got those two nickels? You got them? From those two nickels to a budget of nearly $60 million a year. Two nickels. From a nickel to one God-given idea that produced $89 million. Here's what I'm believing for you. I believe it is yet to be seen what will happen on that one Sunday morning when everybody in the building becomes a faithful and faith-filled 10% Bible tither. I can tell you what I believe is going to happen. I believe folks will throw their eyeglasses away. I believe tumors will disappear. I believe financial increase will start raining down out of heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So now we have a, now we have a decision to make. Now we have a decision. Whatever has been increased from any direction into your life, God stands as he did at the Garden of Eden and the tree of good and the knowledge of good and evil and says, don't touch it and I'll bless you. He stands as you're about to have the greatest victory of your life at your own personal Jericho and says, don't touch it. He stands where you're already celebrating and already blessed living in the wealthiest nation on earth. You are at this moment, regardless of your financial condition, by reason of living in this country, you are in the top 25% of the wealthiest people on earth. Belshazzar, don't put your hand on God's too. Why? So that the curse is abated. And the blessing, you exchange your curse for his blessing. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your Bible said he became poor. Now you can argue all you want, whether during Jesus' earthly ministry he was rich or poor. What a silly argument. I know on that ugly beam, 
No one has ever been more poor. How poor did he become when he left the pavilions of heaven and wrapped around his eternal being, flesh and blood? I'll tell you how poor. He said it would be the same as if you became a worm. That's how poor he became. Why? To break poverty's curse off of your life. Cursed was the ground. But when they planted that crown of thorns and pierced it through his brow and his blood touched those thorns, he said, you don't ever have to labor for thorns anymore. The blessing is released. John the Revelator stood on the island of Patmos and announced, and there was no more curse. You say, well, yeah, that's after we're in heaven. Not so. You have the right to enter into it now. He redeemed you from the curse of the law. Hallelujah.